Hello, my name is Christopher Flint, founder and chief creative officer of Infiniteach. Infiniteach develops digital accessibility tools and provides training to ensure people can access the places they love with the people they love. Our second webinar focuses on the parent perspective to museum accessibility as we are reopening from COVID-19. Both parents on the webinar have a child with an autism spectrum disorder and also work in the cultural institution space. Jackie Spanauer is the director of the Hunter House Victorian Museum in Virginia, and Gretchen Riggs is head of library collections at the Field Museum in Chicago. You can check out their bios in the description. Today's discussion will help professionals working in the cultural institution space better understand and empathize with parents of children with developmental differences, as well as provide some great tips for creating a more inclusive space. We hope you enjoy the discussion and please look forward to more upcoming webinars. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today we have two parents willing to share their perspective with us. Uh, we have Gretchen Rings and Jackie Spainauer here on the Infinity Teach webinar talking about issues related to ASD inclusion and access, uh, especially during COVID-19. Um, and obviously this is a rapidly changing and evolving world. And so as we kind of get to the various steps of this process, it's great to hear from other museum professionals and parents and members of the ASD community to help us how to best understand and welcome and include all diverse learners. So Jackie and Gretchen, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Of course. Thank you for having us. Let's get started with some introductions. And so Gretchen, if you could go first, please, and just give us sure. a little bit of background. What brings you to the webinar today? So I am a museum professional. I work at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, Illinois. I'm the museum librarian, and I'm also the mom of a 12 year old who has been diagnosed with autism and um, so autism awareness and museums are two of my my loves and um, you know just uh, happy to be here to talk about it. Great thank you so much and Jackie what brings you to our webinar today? I come from a very similar background as Gretchen. So I'm also an autism mom. I have a four and a half year old who was diagnosed very early actually when he was one. So I have had three and a half years of unexpected experience as an autism parent. And I also am a museum professional. I'm the director of a historic house in Norfolk, Virginia called the Hunter House Victorian Museum. And I've spent a lot of my extra time doing doing research on how kids with autism specifically can fit into the museum world and how we can make them feel more included. Um, so that's a big passion project of mine. So I'm just really excited to see this conversation. Excellent. I'm excited too. I think it's wonderful Absolutely. that we both have two parents that have diverse learners and kids on the spectrum, but also have this wealth of museum experience to help tie the two things together. Excellent. So let's jump right in. Um, the first question I have for both of you is just in general, how has the pandemic affected your lives? How have things been different? What have been the unique challenges or opportunities since COVID started? Um, Jackie, do you mind starting? Sure. I think if I could sum it up, I would say frustrated. <laughs> um, this has been a really frustrating time, specifically for me having a preschooler. Just he needs the socialization. He's not getting it. And virtual socialization is very difficult, especially with children like ours that have sometimes other accompanying issues like attention deficit disorder and things like that. So it's been very hard for us not having school specifically. Him not having that structure has been difficult. And as a working parent, we've had that added layer of I'm still having to work and while neurotypical children, maybe their parents have, you know, maybe they know a little bit more about how to work from home and teach from home. I cannot. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. it's, it's too much. I have to be full time on my child at all time, um, just for a lot of reasons, for safety reasons, for health reasons. But I have to have all of my attention on him. And unfortunately, just just has not been working very well. So we are really looking forward to him going back to school. I've been really impressed with what a lot of my colleagues are putting online though. I have used some of the resources, specifically aquariums and zoos. My child has loved that, has loved watching the otters at the Virginia Aquarium swim around in their tank. And while that may not fit an SOL or um, a standard of learning in one of the states, that's something that's worked really well for us. Yeah, yeah thank you for sharing. Yeah, I know that. Um, the pandemic and being at home has affected everybody differently. Um, you know, they're the saying that, you know, we're all in the same boat and, and to a sense, you know, we're all in the same water, right? And we all have our different boats is, is kind of how I've been looking at it. 
Uh, Gretchen, what is what is your boat been like since pandemic? I count myself as fortunate for a couple of reasons in that my son is 12, so he's older. Um, he's a little more self-sufficient. And I um, was just blown away by how organized his teacher was and um she you know had a weekly plan plus she was about to give birth at any moment <laughs> but she was she set everything up so the students could follow it i still would have to you know come in and check on him he's very much at this point where he's like mom mom i've got it you know you know but then i'll come and like realize he didn't actually log into the zoom meeting you know he's just waiting for it to start i'm like no you have to so and that was tricky because I was also working at home and I had my own meetings and trying to get my own work done. Um, I think the hardest part about all of this, though, is just the lack of structure. I miss the, you know, okay, now it's time to go to school and then you go to school and then I pick you up. And then, you know, it's just so loosey goosey. And that's been really hard on all of us. Yeah, you can't exactly build a social story for quarantine that's going to work every single day. So I completely agree. Right. Very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you for sharing um, both of you. I think it's really powerful to hear, you know, from firsthand from parents, how this is affecting your lives. And having said that, I think, you know, the next thing I'd like to, to jump into is how can museums help? And so obviously you're both come from the museum world. And so yeah. thinking about your museum or museums or cultural institutions in general, what can they be doing during this time to be most useful to you as a, as a parent? Uh, Gretchen, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, it, it's funny. I, uh, I don't know if this is uh, most people's cases, but for my kids, they really don't, they're not interested in, museums. <laughs> I mean, they're interested if they go, but um, overall, that's not like their thing. And they'll come with me to the, to the field sometimes and be like, can we go now? You know, it's just, that's not their, um, but I think, you know, for a lot of kids, um, like one thing that was really great is the mayor of Chicago put together these videos. They're about half an hour of behind the scenes so people could feel like they were still visiting the museums in Chicago and so we were one and the Shedd Aquarium was another um, and so I think that you know that was tailored towards um, elementary uh, age kids and those were a big hit so that's awesome yeah yeah a few of those are really great <laughs> they're really mm -hmm. Uh, Jackie, how about for you? You mentioned, you know, it's tough being at home. Obviously, we can't go to museums right now, but yeah. what can museums be doing to support you and your family? Um, I think a couple of different things. So for us, you know, specifically for my facility where I am, we are very small. And so there, we had a limited amount of things that we could do with our resources. Um, so we started doing a virtual story time where we had somebody read a story and record it every week and put it up on social media and we had accompanying um, coloring pages. And so that was helpful for a younger demographic that just needed you know, some time to do something on their own that wasn't school. <laughs> um, and so I think that that was helpful. I was just thinking as Gretchen was talking that um, I think something that might be helpful, I, for us what we're really missing is the socialization for his age group. That's what he needs, that's what he builds off of, and it's really hard to fabricate that in a virtual environment. But I, I did notice that, you know, when my son would see somebody that he knew doing a recording, that he would get really excited and he would pay attention to it. So I wonder if that's something museums could do. Like if you have an educator that typically goes to the classes with kids with IEPs or 504s, if that's the person doing the story times, or if that's the person reaching out, that maybe that familiarity might be helpful. Um, I just know that that really did make an, a difference for my son. He really just, he wanted to watch the video over and over and over because it was somebody that he knew and he recognized. And mm -hmm. I think that maybe made him feel, I mean, he can't really verbalize that to me, but I think maybe that made him feel like, oh yeah, that, that's what this was like. So for his age group, for school, they were doing their morning story times a couple of times a week via Zoom, but it was extremely difficult <laughs> to have a four or five year old pay attention on Zoom in a live setting. So, I mean, having the recorded things, I think, helped a lot. And Jackie, you touched on it a little bit, but 
you know, I think we've moved heavily towards the digital side of things, right? Because we mm -hmm. had to in a lot of ways. Um, and, it, and it's great because it gives us access to some content, but there's obviously challenges that come along with it as well. Gretchen, can you talk a little bit more about what those challenges are engaging with digital content for kids on the autism spectrum? It's just, yeah, that screen time can just kind of like, I feel like just kind of sucks the energy out of him, you know, and he doesn't want to then do anything else. So I feel like being able, like he needs that movement. He needs to get up and move his body. And that's something we're really missing right now because his favorite position to be in this whole time from when we were home and learning from home was to be in his bed, <laughs> in his pajamas, doing his work. And I just thought, oh, that's just, it's probably not the most conducive to your learning or, you know, feeling, feeling good, you know, need, needing that stimulation. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we didn't, I didn't take the, you know, I didn't like to take the sensory breaks as much as I, I could have, I mean, eventually I would be like, okay, let's get out for a walk or let's go take the ball, take the dog and throw him a ball or get on your scooters. So. That's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. movement and sensory is such a big thing for kids on the spectrum, and they maybe can get all yeah. the information digitally that they need to, but the they yeah, lack they need that, that input them. into their their bodies, their physical yeah. bodies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's a really good point to make. Yeah, Jackie, how about you? What are your thoughts on the kind of challenges, opportunities when it comes to digital learning presented through cultural institutions? Yeah, I think that there's a common sort of misconception that children with autism are sort of like the good doctor, you know, and they're just obsessed <laughs> with technology and that, you know, and some of them are, some of them, that's their obsession. I have a friend whose child's obsession is airflow and vents. And, you know, they're, they're all over the place. They all have a different obsession. Um, I think there's a huge misconception that um, from people that have neurotypical children, just don't have children at all, that maybe this would work better for us. And I, I would say no. Having the, the virtual online things are not working as well as in person. Yeah. Um, I have seen some other institutions, we did this too, but not specifically for this community, but doing um, like virtual scavenger hunts or scavenger hunts that you could print out at home and then go to a physical location and do. So we put out like an architectural scavenger hunt for the neighborhood that our facility is in. It's a historic neighborhood. And at least that would get the movement out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm having the same problem. My child just is going nuts being in the yeah. house. And yeah. every night we're taking a drive just so that we can get him out. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think movement is definitely, if we can incorporate that in some way, even if that's just, you know, silly songs and dance, that is recorded and put on social media that somehow teaches a concept that that's something that would be really helpful. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I do think there's a lot of misconceptions about what our kids are like and what yeah. they really like okay. to do. They're so, little, little professors and it's like, no, yeah. they just get very engaged in one topic. Yeah. And, and there's also the component of, you know, when, when technology doesn't work, how they react to that. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they're expecting a very, again, our kids ex have expectations of what experiences are like, because usually we have a social story to tell them what that experience is going to be like, whether that's in person or virtually. So if we're giving them the idea of what something's going to be like, and then Zoom cuts off, that could lead to an hour meltdown. So there's yeah. a lot of, of com like moving components and things that maybe a, a museum professional maybe wouldn't think about. Um, mm -hmm. how that child's going to recover, you know, from stuff like that. So mm -hmm. the technological glitches actually can make it worse. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. I get frustrated with that. <laughs> yeah. Your internet connection is unstable. <laughs> yeah. I know. All every time. time. I says that every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I agree with you too about the social piece. I think, you know, people don't think that, or a lot of misconceptions about kids with autism is, oh, they don't, um, have relationships they don't right know, need people and it's absolutely the opposite they really they get a lot out of that socialization and they have friends and I know that's been I asked my older son what does he want to do this summer and he said I just want to hang out with my friends so yeah that's awesome 
Yeah, thank you both for sharing. I think it's really, really important for other museum professionals to hear because I think one of the potential risks of this is because people have put so much energy and effort into online experiences and digital experiences that that becomes the way of the future, right? It's like, oh, we can scale it more, we can reach more people, it's probably more cost effective for museums in some ways. But what I'm hearing from both of you is that there's no replacement for real life experiences and no. going to the museum and being connected that, you know, digital things can maybe enhance or play a part in it, but especially for this population, those connections, those real life connections are, are critically important. If I'm hearing you both, you're, I think you're both sharing that same Yeah, thing. well, and I think most museums haven't figured out how to monetize that digital content either. So, um, yes, it's good to create, and but I, I don't think it'll take the place of our physical collections anytime soon. How, you know, jump in or, you know, following this topic a little bit more, how, how can museum professionals be a strong voice for the ASD community? So like the messages that we're talking about or other um, types of important information that needs to get out there for planning and programming for museums, how can museum professionals be a voice in partnership with the autism community. Do you have ideas or suggestions or ways that those voices can be heard? Because again, you know, it's a it's a small but growing community of individuals mm -hmm. with ASD and it could be easy to overlook, right? Yeah. You know, that population. So how, how do we keep this in the forefront? How do we keep museums thinking about this community as they continue to plan and move forward? I think um, making that a priority, you know, establishing that from the top saying, we want to reach this community. I mean, we talk a lot about that in museums anyway, that we're not reaching all the communities we need to and be supportive of them. So, you know, really, um, and, you know, creating a task um, to, to start somewhere, um, but to really recognize, okay, who are we not reaching and how can we, and, um, in the case of the Field Museum, our president uh, had a personal interest um, in the ASD community. So um, I think he was, I think he was a driving force in getting things off the ground there. Yeah, but definitely. I think it has to start with somebody stepping up and um, saying, you know, we've never done this and yeah. And maybe has a personal interest or, or connection. I think that's that's what oftentimes makes people care. Jackie, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so two thoughts. I think first of all, you you your group did the right thing in having self advocates talk first, right? Um, I think that's really really important to go directly to the group that you're trying to serve. So whenever I'm whenever I'm doing like autism trainings in my area, which I do for some museums around here, what I usually do my first the first thing I say is, do you know Nicole at the Autism Society of Tidewater? If you don't know her, you need to know her. You need to call her. You need to get her cell phone number. You need when you want to do a program, you ask her to come vet it. Um, there's usually around the country there's autism societies that are, um, you know, they have no political affiliation or anything. They're just community groups that have somebody in charge that helps families who are newly diagnosed, who have a new diagnosis, how to navigate that diagnosis. And that can be anything from finding support groups, finding socialization, finding therapies, finding doctors, finding how to do Medicaid, um, anything you can possibly think of. These groups are there for that specific purpose. And so they're always looking for ways to create new avenues for socialization and new community partners. So my number one piece of advice would be find an autism society that's near you if one exists and see if they're willing to come and either vet a program for you or just come and experience your facility and just walk through it with different eyes, you know. Um, and I also suggest to everyone that if you don't have a social story or even if you do, that whoever makes your social stories needs to take a step back and use that social story to actually walk through your museum and see what it's missing <laughs> because you're always missing something because mm -hmm. the journey for the, these children start the second they hit the parking lot or the second they hit the front door. It's not necessarily when they're inside. 
So there's a lot of things that you might leave out. Like you might have a gravelly parking lot and that could get my kid distracted for 20 minutes counting the pebbles, you know? <laughs> so right. um, something you might want to put in. So mm -hmm. um, those are some things that I think people should think about when they're trying to figure out where to start. If you don't have a social story, start one. If you have one, start over um, and try to reach out to the, the local community. So you have those self advocates and people that can actually give you vital information and insight instead of doing a bunch of readings and just sort of trying to figure it out on your own. You know, mm -hmm. we're all very opinionated as autism parents. <laughs> we will tell you what we think of your program. You just have to ask. Right. Yeah. I think those are both great pieces of advice. And so Gretchen talking about your internal community, right? At your museum, mm -hmm. finding the important stakeholders, people that really care about this issue, parents, educators, family members that, you know, individuals with autism themselves. Well, people that care about this and developing a group of people, a task force that can keep these issues in the forefront, I think is really great. And then to Jackie's point too, looking outside of your organization to what does the community have to offer in terms of adults with ASD, individuals with ASD, or groups that can come in and support and keep this work going um, to make sure that museums are as accessible as possible for everyone. I think those are two great pieces, pieces of advice. All right, so now we're gonna move into some more rapid fire types of questions. Um, these are questions that are submitted by museum professionals that they wanted to hear uh, parent uh, opinions on. And so the first one is, you know, as places are starting to open up um, and, you know, museums will probably be open in most days very shortly, although it'll look different than it did before. One of the requirements almost certainly is going to be masks. And we know that individuals with ASD can have you know, definite sensory challenges. Um, how do you see this playing out, uh, Gretchen? You know, in terms of your own son and your experience with ASD, you know, this requirement to wear a mask, how do you see that going when museums and cultural institutions begin to open? Yeah, I, that is a challenge because kids on the spectrum can often find, you know, tags in their clothing to be really um, irritating, you know, just things that you would never think about. Um, what's funny though is with my son, he is very rule oriented. And so he usually, he is very insistent on wearing a mask and he actually will get on me and his brother if we let ours, you know, <laughs> slip at all. Jackie, what are your thoughts on masks? Yeah, I think this is gonna be a point where it's very visible that there's a spectrum in autism spectrum disorder because right. um, I, don't, I don't know if this is a federal mandate or maybe just my state, but children under 10 don't have to wear them. So oh. um, I know if my five-year-old had to wear them, we wouldn't be going. It just wouldn't happen. Um, and I know there's a lot of kids that are going to have aversions. I think she's right, Gretchen, the older kids probably are used to it by now. Um, mm -hmm. But the younger ones, maybe not. So I, I think what's going to happen as museums, we're going to see a decline in the amount of children that are coming to us. And it, it's going to be for a number of reasons, but that might be one of them. Um, you know, I would just urge museum professionals not to be discouraged about it. Everybody, everybody knows that this just has to happen. This is just what we're required to do. So until this phase passes, you know, yeah. people, people will come back when they're feeling comfortable. Yeah. The only thing that I can think of is to try to make it fun. You know, you see some really fun masks, mm -hmm. you know, like with the Field Museum. I, I know we're selling some in our store, um, but you know, you can put like, you know, a dinosaur, mm -hmm. you know, face on it. Like make it like, almost like it's Halloween, you know, um, but. Yeah. That's, you know, and to add to, to add like off of that also, I, I mean, if the thinking, thinking about social stories again, if mm -hmm. you're cutting off certain areas of the museum, make sure that that's in there. You know, I was just thinking about eating and masks and what if you have a restaurant or museums mm -hmm. and, you know, your child comes expecting to get the ice cream that they always get and they can't. So just something else to think about, <laughs> you know, that. Could yeah. Yeah. Like we've had to close our play lab and so we'll have to. We, we're not open yet, but we'll have to advertise that, you know, because yeah. that's a big draw for a lot of families with younger kids. And um, you're, you're both leading me into the next question, right? Oh, Which is that, right? How, how do we let families know? I mean, I think, you know, one of the potential challenges 
with kids with autism that, you know, rely on routines and love routines as they're probably used to going to places, museums included, and having an experience, right? And they're able to predict, right. and, and the experience is going to be different, right, when they re-enter mm -hmm. museums. And so, uh, Jackie, you were talking about social stories as a way, um, you know, obviously we need to get those into the hands of individuals and parents before <laughs> they come to the yeah. museum, right? It's not going to help once you're there, but um, what other strategy or what else can museums think about? or cultural institutions to help prepare individuals and families that have a child with autism to anticipate and predict what to expect? I would just suggest constant communication of how things are changing. I mean, my biggest suggestion is the social stories just because we use it, it's just a crutch for us. We really need it when we're going new places. Um, I have noticed though, and I don't know if this is really across the board, that a lot of places while they might have one, it's a dig to find it or you have to request it. So I really would strongly suggest that it is more visible on their websites um, and on their social media channels, just so that it's something easier for us to get to. Um, you know, and again, with those changes, it's important to get that out to the larger community. So if you know you're serving an autism heavy community, getting it to the society is really helpful. And Gretchen, any other thoughts about how we can prepare families or help them be prepared? I know we're working on that as far as when we roll out because we want people to know that it's going to be a safe environment and um, so like the interactives there's a lot of interactives those are going to be not available for now and I know like yeah. most children love that you know that's one of the, their favorite things to do is to touch screens and uh, fossils and whatever that they can so um yeah so it's it's we're we'll definitely have to let the whole community know because it won't just be kids on the spectrum will be disappointed by that but yeah everyone i think it's also important while we're thinking about this a little bit that that museum professionals are aware that there's probably going to be some more negative um sort of reactions from this community just because there's so much change for the mm -hmm. people that are visiting, you know, having more meltdowns, um, needing more room for quiet space. So if those adjustments can be made at your facility, I would really highly recommend finding some way to create a quiet space. Those are all really good points. And Jackie, you touched on my next question, which how do we prepare museum staff? I know you mentioned, you know, helping them understand that, right, we might see more meltdowns or rigid behavior in museums because kids or adults aren't used to the changes, you know, what advice do you have for museum professionals to be prepared for the reopening of museums? Um, you know, having, thinking about too, that they're going through their own, you know, yeah. challenges during the pandemic times as well, right? And so how do they balance that with best serving museum guests on the autism spectrum? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think this is the perfect time for empathy training. If you haven't done it as a staff before, this is the time because everyone is depressed being at home. Um, I think this, this is going to be a point where people are already predisposed to having that feeling and being able to identify it, having somebody come in and say, you know how you feel this way? An autistic person maybe feels 10 times that. Um, this might be a good point for them to be able to start that initial empathy training. I think that that's really helpful and that's helpful for all guests. That's something all museums should really be investing in especially with your front of line staff that are letting people in and explaining, you know, these are the rules and you have to wear your mask and things like that. Great. Next question. Personally, both of you, you know, having children on the autism spectrum, how comfortable are you at this point going to cultural institutions? Personally, how does that feel to you? You know, and what, what are the variables? Does it matter the size of the institution? You know, can you talk a little bit about that? I'm, I'm pretty comfortable because, um, you know, my son was diagnosed when he was three and now he's 12 and we've really seen huge leaps over the years in his um, emotional and social growth. And, um, and just, you know, working at an institution like a museum, I know how much thought is going into going back, you know, that it's very taken, everything's been taken very seriously. And so I would feel comfortable going to a cultural institution knowing that the same level of thought was going into their reopening. That's great. How about you, Jackie? 
I am both comfortable and uncomfortable. <laughs> um, I am comfortable going. I do not doubt the cleanliness of the facilities or that they are taking it very seriously. My discomfort, I think, comes from, in a lot of ways, like many other parents who have differently able children, um, sort of how my child is going to react to the situation. And if there's going to be a level of meltdown that is embarrassing for me as a parent because I can't control it and are the people around going to be understanding enough of what's happening and I you know that's that's just a constant thing that we live through as parents for these kids but um you know for me it's I don't want to ruin anybody else's experience so I might wait a while to see how he's going to react to me taking him out in public and um, a lot of our kids, I call mine a flight risk. <laughs> but yeah. a lot of our kids oh, don't. Mine used to be too. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, I remember. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and so I worry, you know, if I take him to the museum, is he going to stand next to me like he's supposed to? Is yeah. he just going to dart all over the place? Is he really going to follow the lines on the floor? No. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, I think that there should be expectations sort of by age level. I, you know, a lot of museums do the special hour um, every once in a while for our kids to come in when it's closed. Mm -hmm. I think this would be a good way to use that hour. Yeah. You know, um, especially because we're, all, since all of our kids have the same issues, we're going to understand when they're running the wrong direction and, mm -hmm. you know, it will be less of a safety concern. Mm -hmm. So I think I would feel more comfortable coming for that special extended hour yeah. um, as opposed to just sort of sort of visiting. So I think my final question is around distancing and we know that some individuals on the autism spectrum have challenges with social norms and following social rules and so mm -hmm. you know how do we help prepare both individuals on the autism spectrum and guests and staff at the museum to understand that you know it, individuals on a spectrum may not be breaking these rules intentionally, but just may not, you know, understand or fully be able to adhere to these rules. What are your thoughts on that? Mm, that is tough mm -hmm. um, because over the years, it, it, it has been tempting to be like, well, this is what's really going on, but I don't want to, you know, make it an issue or like there's something wrong with my son, just, you know, um, yeah, I, what do you think? Yeah, Jack, um, you yeah, this is a really hard one. I don't think this is something that's enforceable. I will say visual cues help a lot. If there's a way to put up, you know, the first thing I feel like our kids really recognize is a stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if there's a way to say like, stop here with a stop sign, then maybe that would be helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think with, I think with a lot of things that we struggle with as museum professionals trying to incorporate this community, there's that sense of how do you make this truly inclusive? Because our aim is to be inclusive. So we right. don't want to have our children stand out like they don't need to have a special card that says i have autism so you know here's my free pass when i'm running backwards for 10 minutes you know um that's just not something that is helpful to us it's not helpful to them it immediately makes them different yep. and there's just that fine line i don't know that we're ever really going to be able to perfect that i think that as parents we know our kids well enough to know if they're going to follow the rules or not mm -hmm. most of the time Mm -hmm. So this is really just going to be an individual decision. I don't really think that there's anything museums can really do to put the social distancing at the top of their to-do list for our community. I think it's just going to be the parent deciding, my child really doesn't understand how this works, so we're just yeah. not going to come out right now. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, um, yeah, there might be a way to make it fun, like, you know, somebody kind of enforcing it, but in a costume, you know, mm -hmm. like we have somebody often in a dinosaur costume, just being yeah. like, oh, you know, have it, and you know, um, kind of just engaging mm -hmm. rather than this is a rule, you must follow it. And, and I do think, you know, my son anyway, notices those markers that you see at like stores. Mm -hmm. And again, everybody's different on, on the spectrum. On, and what, why it's called a spectrum. So he's extremely vigilant about those. So he's the ideal rule following child in that way. <laughs> 
So, but yeah, it really is kind of like, is my child going to be able to handle this environment? And one thing that I've been thinking about, you know, and you both touched on it a little bit, I think, is that, you know, I think being part of the autism community inherently means that, you know, everybody's felt, you know, stigma or judged, you know, based on your child's behavior, right? That's mm -hmm. nothing new to any of you. And, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about is how is that magnified during this time, especially, you know, kids that don't like wearing masks because of sensory concerns or kids that don't understand social distancing because of misperception of social norms. And, you know, I guess one thing to think about is, you know, how do we help prepare everybody, not just cultural institutions, but the world to, to not judge as harshly or to have a little more empathy as you mentioned Jackie or understanding around some of these issues because I'm sure you've all yeah. felt it enough and you don't need to mm -hmm. that, especially when everybody's really hyper vigilant about these issues and you know cares passionately about them I can understand where it would come from but at the same time you know like you mentioned Jackie, we're, you're doing the best that you can right and the kids are doing the best that they can and so you know how do we enter this world you know trying to keep everybody safe and making sure that we make it through this in the best way possible, but also having that human compassion, right? And understanding for, for each other is something that I've been thinking a lot yeah. about. Yeah. Awesome. All right, uh, we're running right up against our time, but what I want to do to kind of finish is, could each of you share either a positive or a special moment or something that you learned during this time? I know that, you know, it seemed like the world is in such flux and, you know, it's, it's hard times out there for sure, but I think these are great opportunities to learn and grow and see special things that we've never seen before. So do each of you have a, a special moment or something that happened or something you learned during this time that you could share with us? I just think my son is extremely funny. So, and he's got like a real adult sense of humor. So every once in a while he would just say something, you know, like I, they didn't have Dor his kind of Doritos at the store. <laughs> and so he was like, coronavirus, now it's personal, you know? <laughs> um, and I don't know, he, he teaches me a lot all the time about, what uh about rolling with, with the punches he's actually pretty pretty good with that awesome thanks uh, for sharing with him jackie i think that this time has really taught me just like the resiliency in my child just that you know he really he's different in a lot of ways but he's also able to adapt in ways I didn't really think he could adapt. So he's been, um, you know, like Gretchen had said, our kids really do like socialization. They like people, like to be around people. And it's been really interesting to see him doing so much solo playtime and really enjoying it, enjoying being by himself and enjoying, um, you know, sort of teaching himself. During this time, he's actually taught himself how to read. So <laughs> Um, wow. He's doing his own reading books, you know, um, to himself. And so I just, I'm continually amazed by how smart he is. And just, he's just the sweetest little thing. Like he just will just hug anyone. And that's one of the reasons I'm afraid to take him out is because he likes to hug people. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's a good problem to have though. Like, that's a good problem. So I think this time has, it's been challenging, but it's brought out some parts of his personality that have just been really nice to see. Yeah, I agree. I think yeah. as a whole, kids on the spectrum are, are very resilient. And mm -hmm. I'm thankful a lot of times that there are issues that neurotypical parent, kids of, parents of neurotypical kids have to deal with that I don't, so. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. We'll wrap it up there. Um, I do have to thank you sincerely, Gretchen and Jackie, for joining us for a couple of different reasons. One, for being such strong advocates within the cultural institution community on behalf of kids with autism, and also for being so candid and sharing your perspective as parents of kids on the autism spectrum. You know, for museum professionals that don't have access or in their families or in their communities, to, uh, to parents and to the autism community, your voices are gonna make a huge impact. It was profound for me to hear your messages today, and I'm sure it will be to many, many people around the world that tune in to check this out. So thank you both so much for your time, um, your words of wisdom, and for helping the world to be a more inclusive place. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank it was you. really fun having us. Thank you for watching. I found this discussion very insightful, and I hope you did as well. In the video description, you'll find a link to a document with some of the important messages we took away from the discussion. 
You can always share these with colleagues in your institutions as we all work together to create more inclusive spaces. Be well and stay tuned for our next webinar.